Well, I, I wanted to do a video uh, sort of on a roll. Uh, two new subscribers, 45, so that's that's not a lot. But it's uh, heartening. I've been doing some videos in Spanish, and this one obviously is in English. And um, I kind of opened the Bible at random <coughs> and found this beautiful passage. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes, you know, preaches peace, and who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, says the English Standard Version, who says to Zion, your God reigns. So you have um, this... Uh, good news uh, idea where the word gospel comes from evangelion in Greek and and I, I have good news to share and in this somewhat personal uh, video as I've said in recent videos I have gone through a dark night of the soul very terrible I uh, had been depressed uh, most of 2023, and then in November I had uh, a total knee replacement to which I had, I guess, a bad reaction, not because the, the operation was not done very well, which it was, but perhaps because of anesthesia or not eating for several days and then having things sort of overwhelm me, you know, bad acid indigestion on top of uh, an esophagus that has been damaged uh, in the past, and perhaps the, you know, lack of mobility, whatever it was, it put me very, very low, and actually, you know, I would say suicidal, and so, um, Slowly, uh, but really with some leaps and bounds, I came out of this depression, starting more or less uh, coinciding with taking this prayer and life workshop of Father Larrañaga that I've spoken about, um, which is a 15-week uh, workshop based on enormous experience of this capuchin, La Rañaga, just in case uh, you haven't seen, um, you know, um, other videos, this is, uh, you can look this up in your computer, this is Father La Rañaga. You can't see it very well, I guess. He's got a nice, nice face. In any case, uh, it guides you uh, very subtly, unexpectedly, to where we are now, which is like the 12th, 11th or 12th week. What would Jesus do? which sounds like, you know, corny. By the time you get to the 11th week, it's not corny. It's you're prepared to, to com continue with this complete conversion, which is something that we, we dream of. And I was actually thinking about this last night uh, before I fell asleep. Um trying to have the mind of Jesus, just like Paul says in Philippians 2, and then goes on to narrate the, the Christological hymn where Jesus uh, descends or humiliates himself and then is uh, exalted. And, and, and that's something akin to the dark night of the soul where you can go down very low to be lifted up by God again, as if you're being taken out of the pit, as so many Psalms say, you know, being plucked out 
or grabbed out of the pit. I was actually thinking of uh, Jairus' daughter in, in Mark 5, um, where she is you know, raised from the dead, basically. And um, I don't, I was trying to, to recall uh, what the word was for when he grabs her hand. Uh, but um, I think it would be akin to, to a, a hard grasp, uh, although I'm, I'm not going to look it up now. But um, that does uh, happen in the Bible where God grabs you very hard so that you can't, you know, get away type of thing. And so um, I was, you know, trying to, to, to articulate what I had been experiencing uh, in light of uh, St. John of the Cross. I am lucky enough to have downloaded both the whole autobiography of Teresa of Avila, narrated by a wonderful Carmelite nun, I'm sure, in, I think, probably an authentic accent from Avila, or near near there, and then uh, a very well-spoken uh, Spanish priest that I assume is a Carmelite, who has a series of, you know, chapters or, or you know, talks on St. John of the Cross. And of course, St. John of the Cross tried to explain the mystical path that, that he went through. The purgative life where you are cleansing yourself of sinful, you know, deeds and, and, and vices and then into a uh, illuminative phase where you realize new things like Therese of Lisieux, for example, uh, I was, I'm reading, I'm going to reread her autobiography again, but um, in the int little introduction that I'm reading, it talks about the great graces she received at some point during her dark night that lasted a year and a half or so since probably the beginning of her first coughing blood, I think uh, right before uh, Good Friday, 1896, year and a half of a tremendous, not only physical pain increasing, but a tremendous dark night of faith where she didn't believe or feel the faith of the afterlife, etc. But in the midst of that, she gets these tremendous uh, illuminations of uh, what God uh, is about and what he has been doing secretly and is doing secretly. And then, of course, the result that will result from that. But St. John of the Cross, of course, you know, went through this path, which after the illuminative stage, you go into the unitive stage, where you are uh, in close union with God, uh, you're clinging to God in a very uh, special way. And certainly uh, this prayer uh, and life workshop, um, this is in Spanish, no, this is in English, uh, you know, certainly is getting you to uh, think of God, you know, all the time and to want to pray and to observe diligently the sacred half an hour, could be longer in the morning, especially where uh, a special Bible passage is presented. And, and I spent uh, all this morning on uh, a psalm, which I now forget what it was. Actually, no, I, I spent it on John 17. So the Eucharistic discourse in John 17, I went through the whole thing, and you read it with new eyes. I've read this, you know, several times. I've taken three courses on John. Uh, 
in, in my theological studies. And nevertheless, I read it with new eyes, especially the, the part about, may they all be one, as you, Father, in me and I in you. May they too be one in us, so, uh, I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfectly one. And I, I look that up. I cheat a little bit. I, I devote some time to biblical studies while I'm doing this sacred half hour. Hina osin tete le omenoi eis hen. So I, I, it's actually yes, so that they may be perfectly one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and that I have loved them as you have loved me. Which, of course, is, leads to, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. And I forget now if it's even in the Bible, but in the prayer and life workshop or some other priest said the other day, we should love as Jesus loved until the end and in the way Jesus loved, serving and washing feet, etc. And so um, this prayer and life workshop is actually delivering what seemed incredible when the first session took place, which is really that complete conversion. Now, I'm sure there will be some maybe other conversions. I, I had my first big conversion in 1972. Uh, I was doing LSD at the time and uh, I had one last trip that was awful and the very next day I said this is enough and um, sure enough I had a big conversion and I had spiritual direction etc and about a year later I entered the Dominicans in Mexico to study to be a Dominican priest. I uh, learned a lot of things, experienced a lot of things, still remember a lot of things. This is the uh, the cross from our novitiate, which is one of my favorite images of, of Jesus. And uh, I left uh, due to various reasons that I've talked about off and on here and there. My next conversion was actually seven years later. And I was, again, doing, doing drugs and things like that at uh, Harvard Law School. Not at the law school, but near the law school. And in the spring of 79, I had uh, a big conversion. That, uh, for one thing, one of the lasting effects... So the first conversion, I entered the Dominicans and learned all, all my theology there in Mexico with the Dominicans, basically. My foundation is, is all that from there. But in 79, uh, I think I became convinced that God existed as something that didn't go away, although it was sorely tried in 2023 when I had a lot of rational arguments as to why there couldn't be a God that would allow such evil in the world. So that that's kind of interesting. And then I guess you, you could jump to 1991, when I uh, was not doing so great, mediocre kind of life, and I did the spiritual exercises led by a great Spanish Jesuit, Father Amando Llorente, who is in the glory of God now for sure. He died in his 90s. And I had a conversion listening to him and um, went to a psychiatrist to sort of check me out. And I wound up in the following year entering the Discalced Carmelites in the Dominican Republic, later sent to Spain. So I learned a lot about the Carmelites, even though I was already quite a, a fan of uh, the little flower, Teresa of Lisieux. And then um, I suppose you could say my next conversion was in 2004, when um, after 30 years, uh, 30 years after my mother's death, 
I experienced her alive in, in, in the glory of God, and I had a lot of healing take place, feeling that this was a notion of love that was endless and that you could spend the rest of your life meditating and still not plumb the depths of this uh, ocean of love, an image that I, I see a lot of saints and others have, have also thought about. So that would be my, my fifth conversion. They say Teresa of Avila had several conversions until maybe a more definitive one when he, she was in her 40s. I'm 70. And so uh, 2004 is 20 years ago. And now uh, I have to say humbly that I, I've had a, a, a conversion, of a pretty big one, cumulative because it builds upon all my prior experience. And, and let me try to say some of the, the actual things that have changed in me or, or for me. First of all, um, I was worried about my back, which prevented me from walking uh, or doing the house cleaning, except with some trepidation that I was going to be, you know, not in good enough condition to do that. I like to clean my own place. I just finished cleaning this morning, two-day clean. I did this morning what I used to do in two full, you know, two, two other days. So I can do twice as much now. You could say it's the knee operation. Okay, maybe it's only that. I don't. I know it's not just that. But um, during this convalescence after the knee operation, I miraculously, I, I was, I didn't plan it, lost thirty pounds, and I weighed myself this morning, and I still lost thirty pounds. I haven't gained weight. I'm almost five months after the operation. And uh, that, plus some back exercises that came my way in a sheet, I can clean and walk. I can walk. I have already walked longer than I ever walked in the last few years without problems in my back. So that's incredibly comforting. You know, we, it's true that we feel good when we are consoled by God and, and re, you know, not rewarded, at least uh, regaled, as they say, with, uh, with, with better health. I'm back to my one every other day acid pill, whereas I actually wound up, you know, getting a, a prescription for two acid pills a day. So I'm now back to what I was before, which is a quarter of that. And I may even be able to, to reduce even that. So all my esophagus worry, I have Barrett's esophagus, uh, is, is, is gone. And I can eat and even drink freely with moderation because even in, because of this workshop, I don't have the desire to to abuse or to uh, you know be in 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 moderate in my eating and, and, and drinking so that th these are all great changes that have taken place and they do have to do with physical things I actually implored uh, the Virgin of Our Lady of Lourdes and Bernadette, to which I am very devoted, to please heal my back. And I know from uh, having read a lot about Lourdes, including a 1989 book detailing how, what, what first of all, what cures have taken place as vetted by the medical board over there. Um, and I know that things regarding bones and, and hard tissue, if you will, or hard you know, parts of the body have taken place. Cures that would be 
not psychosomatic or psychological or some other sort of you know soft tissue cures but real miracles of, of changes in bones and things like that so I, I believe that I my prayer was answered by uh, Our Lady and by 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 Bernadette um, this is uh, la Madonna della Strada to whom I prayed when I was going to Rome in 96 to not leave me on the street. She's Our Lady of the Street or, or of the Way. And that's my own picture from the Church of Gesù in Rome where I would pray before this image as did Pius XII with some uh, regularity. And this is Mary Help of Christians, Maria Auxiliadora from my uh, refrigerator magnet, which I bought in Turin when I visited John Bosco's rooms, uh, guided by uh, the person in charge at the time, Deborah, a dear you know, Italian friend, even though we only knew each other a little bit. So that um, I'm trying to, to, to articulate what I sense has been happening and it has to do with this hidden God whom we sometimes find to be too hidden, too silent. I have a, an essay on my website which is now up and running after a couple of days of the transfer from uh, a Windows-based platform to WordPress miraculously. This is another blessing that just landed on my lap. I was ready to not have the website. Um, I was ready to lose the program that I used to work on the website. I work very little on it and I, I'm not an expert on, on, on website building but I had this uh, web expressions uh, which I thought would disappear when I upgraded to Windows 11. Web expressions is no longer available or in existence uh, except by people that downloaded it 10 years ago. And all of a sudden through a friend I get into contact with a person that for $400 will rebuild my website just like it was before and um, with Bluehost, I have a very economical payment uh, to make every year or every three years. So it's very doable because I, not many people visit the, web, the website, but I, I, I want to share the things that I've written. And one of the things I wrote is called God and Essay, including a chapter on the theodicy uh, and the... Uh, unanswered silence of God and it's supposed to be published in book form by my friend and I even signed the contract and everything for it I who knows what might happen with that but nevertheless that's another blessing and, and some other blessings have taken place and that all that all makes you feel uh, much better and, and in the prayer and life workshops, you, you learn to, I, at least I, I interpret it as learning to appreciate the healing and the strengthening that God can send you to prepare you for future struggles that undoubtedly will come. There is always going to be this cross. So at night now, I'm reading... Uh, a little bit of the Treatise on Truth Devotion to the Virgin by Montfort. Uh, and then I read a little bit of the uh, autobiography of Therese of Lisieux. And lastly, I read uh, The Imitation of Christ. I'm starting The Imitation of Christ from the beginning again. I'm reading it in Latin. And uh, I used to memorize, I, I memorized a lot of it when I read it in English back in 70. Two, and I would actually, you know, sometimes repeat it 
in 73 in Mexico as a Dominican novice. The reason I mentioned that is because it does talk about, you know, carrying the cross and conforming your life to Christ. Following Christ, who follows me, doesn't walk in darkness, etc. So it should be our whole study to conform our life to Christ, have his attitudes. The prayer and light work workshop talks about having his gaze, the, the look to look at people with the same look Jesus would have. I know Sister Faustina of the Divine Mercy uh, Visions talks about that too. Speaking like Christ, treating others, seeing others like Christ would see them. It's actually part of the prayer and life workshop. One of the readings this week is Matthew 25. I was hungry, you gave me to eat. Whatever you did to the least of these, the lowest rank of, of these fellow humans, you did to me. So this is all stuff that I, we've heard for a gazillion years, but to start taking it seriously uh, is a new thing for me, or at least I am thinking about it with a new brain and looking at it with new eyes. And that is a mysterious working of God. So that uh, one of the senses that I have is that of restoration, to be restored, except even better. So obviously my, my, my walking and my knee has been restored with, with an artificial implant to much better than it's been for, for years. I hurt my knee over 40 years ago or around 40 years ago. And it got worse over 40 years. That's a generation in the Bible. And um, things just begin to come together. Things in my church begin to come together. I was able to participate in a, I call it a passion play, but it's really the Stations of the Cross, um, you know, uh, enacted, dramatized. I don't think I could find any images of that now, but I was the one of the narrators, and uh, it, it made an impact. Uh, the priest said, "Are you an actor, or were you trained as an actor?" And I go, "Not really." But what happens is that what is inside of you, sort of hidden, but developing mysteriously and adapting and changing and maybe ups and downs and all that, but there's growth there, just like the parable of the sower. You don't know how it grows, but then it, it grows. And so to be aware of that action of God, because God is the one who, who does the growing in you, um, is part of our spiritual task of uh, self-knowledge and knowledge of God, which of course are related. And so all these, all these nice things, all these good news things have been, have been taking place so that um, what does this, uh, you know, evangelizer or bringer of good news proclaim peace, the good news of happiness, it says here. The Vulgate says good, uh, you know, uh, he, he brings shalom and he's a good news bearer of tov, which would be good or goodness. And of course, Yeshua, salvation, the name which is Jesus, and who says to Zion, your God reigns, Elohecha, uh, Malach, Malach uh, reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they sing for joy, for eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. So this is a great passage in Isaiah, of, of second Isaiah, chapter 52, the end of exile. 
So I have just basically ended my exile, maybe one of them, but it is uh, an occasion for good news, and it won't be washed away or disappear or grow old, I, I don't believe. My hope is, and my faith is, that I have changed. I mean, I'm rather old now. I don't have too many other, uh, maybe springs, as they say, or something like that. And what's interesting about this, 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 this passage of the end of exile, which is what Second Isaiah proclaims to the exiles in Babylon, I believe. I don't believe he was back in, stayed back in the Holy Land, as some some scholars believe. Um, what's interesting about this passage in Isaiah fifty-two seven which is maybe probably the first great instance of good news. The other one would be um, in 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the Anawim, I think it says, and, and liberty to captives, etc. And I forget it, what what other good news, famous good news in Isaiah there is. Um, and I'm not going to, you know, be concerned with that right now. But right after um, this, uh, verses 7 to 10, that Yahweh has bared his holy arm, just like in Egypt. He bears his arm to save. This is before the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. You know, um, all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. God. Um, I don't know whether, yeah, verse 10, it should, should be there. Um, a, okay, yeah, the Yeshua Eloheinu, so that, um, then you get into a sort of a warning, uh, leave, Depart, go out from there, touch no, no unclean thing, go out of the of Babylon, actually. Uh, purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. And I'm guessing, you know, Cyrus allows the vessels stolen by the Chaldeans or Babylonians to be returned. You shall not go out in haste. It says, uh, and you shall not go out in flight, unlike the first exodus. This new exodus is better. For the Lord will go before you, and the Lord of Israel will be your rear guard. So God goes before you, and he also is your rear guard, and it's like John George Harrison at both ends of the road to the left and the right, above and below us, out and in. There's no place you're not in. Hear me, Lord, that great song by the uh, Hinduish George Harrison. May he rest in peace. And right after that beautiful a good news passage with this sort of warning about leaving, but with the assurance that God is with you. He, he goes before you and, and is your rear guard, protected, you're surrounded by God. One of the topics of the uh, Prayer and Life workshop is to feel yourself enveloped by God as you cling to Him. I'm kind of adding that last one or paraphrasing what the workshop says. What follows after this? Probably my favorite passage. I did my license to Sina at the Gregorian on the so-called fourth song of the suffering servant. 
But that song itself, that poem itself, is actually a three-part, three-part uh, poem, with the first part being about the exaltation of the servant, triple exaltation. In the Greek, it's like the Gospel of John, he shall be lifted up and glorified. So the lifted up would refer to his crucifixion, but also exaltation, double meaning pun. When I am lifted up, I will draw all to myself, John 12, 32, I believe, or maybe 37, 20, uh, John 12, 32, when I am lifted up, I shall draw all to myself. And then uh, glorified is the same as the crucifixion. He glorifies his son, and the son is glorified exceedingly. And you have the book of glory, the second part of the Gospel of John. So the triple exaltation in Hebrew becomes a double exaltation in the Greek, pretty much like the Gospel of John. Then you have the narration of, about, of, of the fate of, of what happened to the servant, which is that he was humiliated, afflicted, the, the sin of us all on him, etc., then the third part of the uh, poem is the uh, vindication of the servant. You, you know, so so uh, the work of the Lord will prosper in His hands. By His knowledge, He will justify many. He will divide the spoils with the strong, because He poured His soul to death and was numbered among transgressors. And, and so you have the, you know, exaltation of the servant at the end of the poem also. It's a little bit like our life. We, we are, you know, born and then go through tremendous hardships. And in the end, we hope to return or to, to go to God. And, uh, you know, thinking about that path, that journey, is what I am trying to do with this uh, modest video to uh, share a little bit of how my journey has gone uh, 70 years, which is actually the, um, the time that Jeremiah says the exile will last, which is what Daniel uh, was pondering because more than 70 years had passed at the time of Daniel. And, um, you know, um, and, and so he has to have an angel come and explain to him uh, how to read the text in Jeremiah about the 70 years and if you switch around the vowels in the Greek, uh, you get 70 weeks of years, which multiplies it by 7. So 70 becomes 490. And um, I was sure I would see this quickly. And apparently, well, it's like, it is pretty quick. I have one of my little short notes on biblical topics uh, setting out how this works of the 70 weeks of years. So if you wanted to take a look at that, you could do that uh, if you're that interested in this kind of thing, which I, I, I would be very pleased if you were. But nevertheless, uh, in, in finishing, um, we certainly have, uh, this is the Jesus that Teresa of Avila liked, showing his uh, pierced hands and his crown of thorns. Actually, I, I, this frame I bought for a lady that I visited, uh, as the community of Sant'Egidio recommends, at a nursing home who died this very day 
I guess uh, 11 years ago, if it was 2000, no, it was probably, anyway, she, this is the anniversary of her death. Uh, I think she died in 2010 or something, so maybe, maybe 14, 14 years ago. Of course, this is the uh, Christ uh, of the community of Sant'Egidio, one of the uh, people that I have met in my journey that I am very happy to have met. And I don't know if I showed this already. This is my Russian, I think, 19th century cross that I bought in the Roman flea market. So I just wanted to share those images in case you're able to, to see them. This is my Johannine kingly Christ given to me by a Dominican friar in Mexico who now is with the Lord, Father Gabriel Chico. So that I wanted to share, you know, maybe not too articulately. <laughs> I didn't do it too articulately, I don't think. But... Um, the fact that God in a hidden way can be working and then all of a sudden uh, you uh, you see this light and you get a new lease on life and you should uh, take these thoughts into account in, in your journey as I uh, think about it you know all the time you know I just wanted to say something I mean I like to share little uh, tri trivia, if you will. If you read um, Steve Mason, uh, who's one of the great experts on Josephus, the historian that talks about Jesus and John the Baptist, he says that he, 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 he talks about Jesus in the midst of talking about lots of sort of violent and, and confusing and turbulent things. And all of a sudden, you know, authentically, because even though there are additions to and interpolations to Josephus, there is an authentic core of what he said about Jesus. It's less than what he says about the Baptist, but nevertheless, he talks about Jesus. And Steve Mason says that, I think in Josephus in the New Testament, he says that it's like you're in a, in a Middle Eastern bazaar full of confusion, and all of a sudden you step through a door and you're in this completely calm and quiet place. And it, it, when Josephus talks about Jesus, it's like leaving that confusion of the Arab, you know, bazaar and stepping into this, this paradisiacal, peaceful oasis. And so let's keep that image in mind. And then, of course, after that, you go back to the bazaar and the confusion and all that kind of stuff. But let's keep in mind the fact that we can always turn to God. We can always turn to God uh, in meditation and prayer. And I'll stop there. This cross, I took the picture in the Carmelite, the Scals Carmelite community of Elizabeth of the Trinity, which was in Dijon and then moved to Flavignajo, and I was there around this time, 2011. I was there April 6th, April 7th, and this is a beautiful, exalted Christ, just like in Isaiah, uh, an exalted Christ on the cross, combining both the crucifixion and the exaltation. I didn't quite realize that until now. So expect surprises from God, who is, as I've said in other occasions, chesed and emet. He is surprisingly unbelievable acts of kindness that you don't expect. And he's also emet, meaning you can rely on, as with the word amen, which is the same root as Emmet, you can rely on God to do what you never believed he could do. And that's a, a true thought that I have experienced and that I, you know, in my humble way, give witness to. I think we can, we can stop there.